Good evening, everyone. Uh, so today we will be doing our fifth webinar on uh, host. If you can mute everyone else, please. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So today we'll be doing our fifth webinar on uh, retinal diseases for comprehensive ophthalmologist. Today we'll be dealing with some of the things which as a general ophthalmologist, we quite often have dilemma, like uh, looking at a peripheral retinal lesion before cataract surgery, we quite often we wonder wh whether we would do laser or whether we should refer the patient or whether we should uh, go ahead with the cataract surgery. Similar confusion arises when we see a membrane on the retina on, at the macula or a dull foveal reflex before cataract surgery. So to address these dilemmas, we have a galaxy of the retinologist of OSWB who will, who will be presenting and uh, raising the awareness for the comprehensive ophthalmologist how to deal with these situations. So before I hand over the mic to Dr. Sneha Jain and Dr. Kumar Saurabh, who is moderating the meeting today. I would like to invite Dr. Kajal Prashad Ghosh, President of Ophthalmological Society of West Bengal, to say a few words. Uh, Dr. Kajal Prashad Ghosh, please. Kajal, are you here? Dr. Kajal Prashad Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh was here just a few seconds back. Sir, yes, Kajal, you have to unmute yourself, yes. Hmm. Yes. Hello. Thank yes, you so everyone. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, who is present over here. Thank you, all the speakers and everything who is presenting this. Uh, I'm presenting this paper. And um, really I am delighted to be a part of this seminar. Practically, it's a, it's a question uh, faced by every one of it, as explained by Sugato. When the, there's a membrane, when there is uh, what to do with the membrane. <laughs> mm, so, uh, I am confident this seminar, and we have uh, very erudite speakers, and I'm mm, they will really try to solve the problem and ease our way in future. And I'm confident the seminar will be extremely successful in this regard. I applaud the Retinal Society for organizing such a seminar. Congratulate the participants for their interest and work and look forward for a bright, insightful presentations. Thank you, Shuvato. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, so I'll hand over the meeting to Dr. Kumar Shaurav and Dr. Sneha Jain to carry the meeting forward. And I will request the presenters and the uh, panelists to keep their comments and keep their presentation within the time limit so that we don't exceed the time. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Sneha. Uh, good all, uh, good evening, all of you. I think uh, Dr. Kumar sort of uh, will start the uh, presentation. We'll start by introducing all our chairs and panelists. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Kumar Saurav. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. And uh, we are happy to have uh, our chairpersons, Dr. Kian Biswas and Dr. Tushar Kantisina. And uh, the panelists uh, will be Dr. Uh, Professor Rasim Kumar Ghosh, uh, Dr. Subindu Boral, uh, Dr. Rupa Kanti Biswas, Dr. Zahir Abbas, and Dr. Devasis Baragi. All of them are. Uh, eminent vitreotina specialist and the pride of West Bengal. And next we have the speakers, Dr. Sneha. Yes, sir. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce all our speakers. We have with us very eminent personalities uh, of field, in the field of ophthalmology with us today. And uh, so the first speaker for today is Dr. Sudipto Das. 
Sir is uh, currently attached to Netralem and the BBI Foundation. And we also know him as co-authoring a chapter in the sixth edition of Ryan. So welcome, sir. So our next speaker is Dr. Shaurav Sinha. Sir is a very humble and a great teacher. And he is currently uh, attached to Netralem and BBI Foundation. Our next our speaker is Dr. Rupa Croy. Uh, eminent personality with lots and lots of publication and he's from Shankar Netralay, Kolkata. Uh, next speaker, Dr. Anirudh Maiti, all of us know him. He's been, he's attached to a multiple, uh, you name it and he's there. He's attached to Netralay and BBI Foundation, Amri, Amulya Jyoti and Spectra Hospital. So has several, uh, bad several awards in the national and international conferences. We also have with us Dr. Pranab Das. He's from the Center of Sight, Kolkata. And sir is an alumnus of uh, PGI Chandigarh. So uh, welcome, sir. Dr. Shomna Chakraborty, he's, a, he's from Retina Institute of Bengal, Shiliguri. We uh, know him as a very jovial and nice person. So uh, welcome, sir. I would also like to tell you about uh, the... Um, format of this thing. It's a 10 minute, uh, like every, all the sessions will be a 10 minute session. After that, we'll have a small discussion between that. And I uh, like to uh, stick to the discussion for about two to five minutes max. And then we can go on to the next session. We, uh, I would encourage all our participants to please type in your queries and us expert panels and speakers would love to uh, solve them or to answer those queries. Uh, we will take up all the questions, but maybe not during the session, but at the end of the session. So please stay glued to your screens. And so with this, we can now start with our session. Our first speaker is Dr. Sudipto Das. He will be uh, briefing us on peripheral retinal screening before cataract surgery. So on to you, sir. I'll just stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Sneha and uh, Dr. Shorov. I, uh, I thank OSWB and Shugotada for this uh, opportunity. So I'll be going in short and brief about uh, the importance of peripheral retinal examination before cataract surgery. So are my slides visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay. So I think we all practice certain pattern uh, of uh, peripheral retinal examination as, and as well as treatment before we plan cataract surgery. So what happens in cataract surgery? So if you can see this uh, schematic diagram, so what happens, we, you get a posterior capsular movement, uh, some turbulence, which sometimes uh, creates a suction around the vitreous and which causes a posterior traction, which causes a retinal problem. So this probably is a basic pathophysiology about uh, treating or maybe examining retina to uh, prevent some inadvertent post-operative effects. So the pathology starts with a posterior vitreous detachment. So the, there is a diagram, you can see the number two is the posterior vitreous. There's a retinal tear happening, which is number one here. And we have a retinal detachment because of that. So this is the basic pathology which happens in retinal detachment. So few things to remember. The first thing is probably the flashes, which usually we see uh, uh, with the patients usually have a symptoms of flashes because of this posterior vitreous movement. And the patients uh, sometimes will have floaters because of the cyanuresis of the vitreous gel. So these are the primary things which we see when we see a patient suffering from vitreous detachment. So what happens in acute PVD? The most important, this is a typical wise ring we, see, we can see in front of the disc. So 10% of patients with acute onset floaters and flashes have retinal break. So this is uh, from, uh, from meta-analysis and pigments in the vitreous or signs of hemorrhage in the vitreous indicates retinal break in around 77% of patients. So how do we get detachment? Now this is a normal looking retina in the left side. We get a, a probably this, there's a retinal break here. So a PVD has caused a retinal break uh, and then it has subsequently caused abnormal retina and retinal detachment. So the evidence, the scientific evidence, if we can go through the phacoemulsification part, it has been associated with PVD induction of up to 60% one year after surgery. This I have to keep in mind. 
10 years after either FICO emulsification or ECC, the cumulative probability of RD was 5.5 times higher than normal and NDR laser posterior capsulotomy associated with an increased incidence of retinal attachment. These three points, I think, is quite evident uh, to all. So what in case of renal population, if you see the risk of retinal attachment, it is around one in uh, 5,500 patients per year. <clears throat> in myopia, more than minus 10 diopter, it's one in 147 per year. In case of after cataract surgery in general population, it is one in 86 per year. But after cataract surgery in myops, it is one in 45, almost double the general population. And post of retinal attachment had been also noticed after cataract surgery with untreated breaks. So peripheral retinal degenerations, if we classify the things, the broadly the classification is about lattices and non-lattices. Now lattice can be lattice alone. It can have atropic holes or it can have retinal tears. On the other hand, non-lattices are usually the same tract degeneration, the microcystoid degeneration, paving stone degeneration, and white without pressure. These non-lattices usually don't require uh, prophylactic therapy until, uh, unless and unless very special circumstances. Retinal breaks on the other side can be retinal holes or retinal breaks. The retinal holes are usually atrophic holes or operculated holes where the part of the retina is already evolved from the retinal hole. And retinal breaks can be horseshoe tear, dialysis, or retinal break. The most important point probably is that retinal breaks uh, are usually associated with posterior vitreous detachment or the, uh, or the pathology is most related to vitreous movement. This patient who had, a, who had multiple HSTs here was untreated. Similar type of patient, un, uh, untreated HST can have a, you can see a localized retinal attachment here. And if we can, if we wait or if we cannot treat the patient timely, this patient can come with a retinal attachment, which is being seen in the right side. So this is the macula, which is partially detached because of the retinal attachment. Now, what is important? A dilated retinal examination should be done by a trained specialist to screen for all retinal degeneration and the status of posterior vitreous detachment. Alternatively, one can use a non mitreactic ultra wide field fundus camera to image the retina, but we have to keep in mind this is a very high specificity. If we get something, definitely it's true, but the sensitivity is very moderate in this ultra wide file imaging. It's around 57% in meta analysis. So, untreated eye, if you don't treat, maybe after a very successful cataract surgery, can some patient can come with this amount of consequences. So what, what to do? So these are a few manuals, few guidelines. This is a Moorfields guideline about uh, treating a retinal degeneration or retinal tear. If you can see this lattice degeneration, if it is with PVD or incomplete or no PVD, the minus sign shows that we seldom treat these patients. If you have a risk factor, it's variable or contentious. Risk factors such as fellow eye having a retinal attachment, but if you have a subretinal fluid, you should always treat this patient. Round holes in lattice, most of the time, even with PVD or incomplete PVD, it's you seldom you should treat. Risk factors, definitely, we should add laser. So SRA with subretinal fluid, we have to treat all. The acute flap shaped tears or with or without lattices needs laser in almost all situations. Fully operculated round hole usually doesn't require treatment because it is detached from the posterior vitreous detachment. But if you have risk factors, we have, we have fellow eye retinal attachment of subretinal fluid, we have to treat. So this right side, if you have a SRF, you treat virtually all. If you have risk factors, it's almost you treat in most of the conditions or it's variable. Incomplete PVD, you may not treat until you have a flap. If you have a PVD, except from flap, other things you can observe. The second manual is from Shankar Neutralai guidelines where the patients, if you have asymptomatic patients, which is more important in our condition, the guidelines to treat holes and tears in asymptomatic patients. If you can see here, atrophic holes, it's rarely being treated even prior to cataract surgery. Operculated holes also usually rarely treated. Lateral degeneration with or without holes, it's also rarely treated most of the condition. But horseshoe tear, subclinical retinal attachment, dialysis, all require laser or prophylactic barrage despite uh, the patient is being asymptomatic. So this is prior to cataract surgery. If we think atrophic holes, aperculated holes, and atrial degeneration, there are a few um, uh, data or maybe some uh, conflicting data about doing the laser or not to do the laser. I'll go to a, fine, a line in the discussion part. In case of symptomatic patients, I think all requires laser except atrophic holes, which can be 
uh, which people can sometimes do, but it's rarely being done. Symptomatic patients, if we do laser, we need to treat. We have to have to have serial follow-up. We need to recheck the fundus in case of significant increase in floaters or fresh uh, onset of flashes, shadow in the peripheral field or sudden dimness of vision. You have to always keep in mind in patients, symptomatic patients, even if we treat how to follow up these patients very frequently. So this patient who had a lattice and atrophic hole, this lattice has been nicely barraged here. You can see the fresh laser marks, confluent laser uh, with the, uh, in the lattice. This is a horseshoe tear. Uh, ASIM, uh, was mild symptomatic patient with some amounts of flashes and you can see the laser marks post laser. The HSTs are nicely barraged. This patient had a retinal tear, which has been lasered nicely with three to four rows encircling the retinal break. But if we should not, we should, should not give up. If in, uh, we, things go wrong, maybe timely intervention can actually bring out good vision in these patients, even if you have a post-operative complications. So take home message, risk of retinal attachment is high in myopes and following cataract surgery, as we have seen few evidence. In myopic eyes, the risk of retinal attachment increases further with pre-existing retinal weak areas. Retinal attachment risk in the contralateral Hello. Sir. Uh, Your voice is not audible. Dr. Sadipto. Hello, Dr. Sudipto, are you? We... Ah. Uh, so I think we got right? the presentation. Yeah. The last bit we missed. Yeah, last bit we missed. So we can start the discussion if required. Yeah. Yeah, there was one question uh, for Dr. Sudipto Das. But uh, is you he can actually... take the panelist. We can discuss yeah. with the panelists so, the questions. So that question was, sir, that uh, in his in the presentation he showed that if we have a lattice degeneration before uh, before a cataract surgery, so there is a dilemma whether to do cataract laser barrage or not. So what is the panelist's take on that lattice degeneration where there is no hole? So I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Saurabh Sina, sir, for uh, regarding this. Uh, I am not a panelist, I am a speaker. So, <laughs> no, sir. Uh, we can start from you. But I think there is a little bit of controversy on this. Uh, each of us from different schools of thought practice differently. Uh, the Shankaranathira school of thought, which I have practiced the last 20 years and most of us practice is any lattice pre catastrophe detected should be lasered. I know a lot of people do not agree with this. This is what I practice. Uh, people look for a hole, people look for traction on the lattice. In that case, definitely. Uh, if a lattice, I'll, I'll keep it easy. If there is a lattice with a hole or a, with a gross traction, definitely do the barrage laser before cataract surgery. Uh, what I practice is any lattice before cataract surgery, I barrage it. Wait for three weeks, see if it's okay, and then do the cataract surgery. I know this is a bit controversial. Lattice laser treatment, anyway, itself is a very controversial subject by itself. That's a whole meeting by itself. Yeah, so the next question was, sir, how long do we, um, for this, this may be taken by Dr. Bairagi or Dr. Zahir Abbas, that how long should we wait after doing barrage laser to advise, to go ahead with the cataract surgery? So suppose we laser, do laser today, and how, when should we do cataract surgery then? Uh, usually I wait for one month time because uh, we have to wait for scar to develop, the addition to develop uh, before uh, go for surgery. So one month I wait. Yeah, Dr. Sourav said, uh, Dr. Sina said three weeks, so more, uh, three to four weeks. Is that? Yeah, three to four weeks. And uh, regarding the first and question, the... as Dr. Yeah. Uh, regarding Please the first go. question, as Dr. Sourav Sina, I, I totally agree with him. Uh, I do laser for, for all the lattices before cataract surgery. No, and... I do for all these. I do, I do for lattices. I do for all lasers. I do for all lattices. Yeah. And, and especially one eight patient and who has family history and also uh, fellow IRD. No, I do lattice, I do laser for all lattices. Yeah. Oh, no, I do for all. Yeah. And one, uh, 
it is better yes, to do laser because uh uh so your mute your voice is huh. so, uh, i i think that uh, dr shourab's decision is to some extent to be granted that previously it was written in the textbook that lattis with whole with a fellow i r d or a myopic eye that has to be lasered immediately but all any lattis can develop uh, after operation at any time to cause tears so it is better to do laser beforehand and then do the cataract surgery i think so it will be better for the person who will be cataract operated for cataract with lattis okay thank you sir there is one more scenario where the, uh, there is one more scenario sir like symptomatic pvd like patients one there is one patient who is having flashes he is having checkup he, he or she is not having any retinal break we call her after one month then she the flashes has come down floaters are still there and if the person has also has got significant cataract and wants to undergo cataract surgery but he did not have any break only symptomatic pvd with flashes and floaters so how how long should we wait for cataract surgery in such an eye or should we wait or we can just go ahead with the cataract surgery because the patient doesn't have any break or retinal tear so this can be taken up by uh, our panelists uh, dr rupa kanti biswas dr subendu boral uh as of now i i, I think regarding sort of regarding the first question also i totally agree with what dr sinha says and uh, we the, the take home message should be even without any hole also any lattice before cataract surgery should be treated and wait for 3 to 4 weeks that should be standard protocol regarding your second point if there is active pvd even if there is no retinal tear also we should not advise for cataract surgery at that point of time i would uh, prefer to wait till the pvd subsides because the logic behind this is that once you do cataract surgery because of the undulation of the anterior vitreous phase the pvd will increase further and the pvd can you know uh, uh, can uh, uh, progress much faster which can lead to uh, retinal tear in post operative period so it is a good idea wait for some more time so that the pvd settles down and then plan for cataract surgery so roughly sir how much time should it take uh, no again pvd uh, how long it will take it is difficult to uh, uh, you know predict but mm -hmm. i will prefer that uh, once the pvd stops and wait for another 2 to 4 weeks and then after that okay so 2 to 4 weeks and then reassess and then uh, go ahead decide about the surgery exactly exactly i have a quick question if i can ask please yes. if yes. the cataract is significant enough where we cannot give effective laser will you differentiate between the type of lattice you are having will you differentiate uh, whether it's lattice with hole or lattice without hole if it is lattice without hole and we are failing to give eff effective laser will you go ahead with cataract surgery or we advise cryo in this situation lattice without hole and I was, will it be a different in lattice with hole i was tactically avoiding this question and avoiding <laughs> this scenario <laughs> no no it's, it's a common this scenario is gray zone i know this is completely gray zone but uh, i completely agree with you in if the uh, cataract is significant enough you can see lattice but you are not able to treat that lattice then what to do so in that situation personally i will prefer that do cataract surgery and immediate post op period maybe if if you do it with the indirect ophthalmoscope after one week you can go ahead for the cataract i mean for the uh, for the barrage of that uh, lattice but the problem is that ki, uh, uh, another option is that doing cryo but if you don't do cryo uh, the uh, doing cryo sometimes can induce pvd or other complications also but uh, this is also another option do cryo and wait for another 2 to 3 3 uh, to 4 weeks and then do cataract thank you sir thank you rupa sir sudipto sir do you have uh, raised your hand so yeah yeah i i ah, just, yeah, yeah i have a question for panelists to do all follow the same protocol for intravitreal injection also prophylactic laser before intravitreal injections yeah i do i do uh, prophylactic laser before uh, intravitreal injection because okay. uh, you need to give multiple injections and uh, there is a chance of developing tear and detachment so i do laser 
but say so you will wait again for uh, three weeks uh, before you treat. And that I compromise. I, I give after two weeks. Yeah. So there is one quick question. Now, if somebody um, somebody can take this up, there's a question in myopic patient with minus six diopter of immature cataract at with immature cataract, NS3, 75 years old lady, incomplete PVD. Should I wait for PVD to get completed before cataract surgery? I think Dr. Rupak uh, Miswas sir has already answered this. That we will we have to wait for the PVD to get completed and then we will go for the cataract surgery. The question is complete PVD. Why he again sees or he is asking the PVD to be complete? No, the question was said a complete PVD with the cataract. So why there is there any time required for waiting another time span for seeing the complete PVD? The question has some confusion. No, the question. Wait for incomplete PVD. Incomplete PVD, sir. Oh, incomplete. Now you can do, you can do, you can do, but uh, sometimes it is also dubious to answer uh, for mm. how many, uh, how, how, how much it will be, uh, it will wait for the uh, operation for cataract. Okay. So in rather, in that scenario, sir, probably as Dr. Rupak Vishwas sir said that maybe we could, we, should, we can check the patient after two to four weeks again <coughs> to see whether the flashes have come down and then take a call about the cataract surgery. That should be the way to go. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, another question. Sorry. If, no. if for uh, the take home message for comprehensive ophthalmologist is if they're doing laser, do the laser for any lattices before cataract surgery or refer right. to their retinal colleague for cataract surgery uh, for laser and then wait for three to four weeks. And same goes for intravitreal injection as well. Mm -hmm. Now, what about non-lattice degeneration, as uh, Dr. Sudip Todas has mentioned, like snail tract degeneration or white without pressure or microcystic changes? If the patient is high myopic, say minus eight or minus nine, mm, we uh, will the protocol uh, differ no, or shall we just go ahead and cataract surgery? Nothing to be done. Nothing, nothing to be done. done. Thank you. Thank you. So, as a comprehensive ophthalmologist, we need to differentiate between lattice and non-lattice non first to take a call, right? Right, sir. Right, sir. Yeah. So thank Can you. Can I so make one very quick point? Yes, sir. I insist to everybody, everybody, cataract is not an emergency. Nothing will happen. Hold on two months. Nothing is going to happen. Patient may run away. Doesn't matter. But you don't get into problems. <laughs> yeah, yes. So that we don't run up, have to run after the medical legal consultant. Thank right. You. Yes. Thank, thank you, you. Shaurav. Thank you. So next speaker is Dr. Saurabh Sina, sir, who will be uh, talking about dull foveal reflex. So Dr. Sina, please share the slides. Is my slide visible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. I will go beyond 10, I'll go on 11 minutes, I think, and I'll stop at that. Uh, if I cross 11, please do stop me. So dull fovea reflex, what do I what to think? Um, the dull fovea also sometimes written variously as RP alterations, sometimes vaguely as a macular assist, something somebody sees in the macula, some large hemorrhage, something looks a little bit like a hole. So variably people make different diagnoses. And I'm, I will try to bring some some methodology, methodology to that and reorganize your thoughts uh, I, and let's see what we can do, where we'll get. Doctor, uh, I have been a specific instruction by uh, to talk about laminar hole, epithelial membrane, vitreo macular traction, macular telangiectasia, and myopia macular, all five in 10 minutes. So I, I think each is one conference by itself, but I'll try to do justice to that. But as Sangeeta was very specific, sir, So I will not discuss classification, the pathology and treatment of any, any of these any of these diseases. I will try to stick to what we see in the OPD. We threw some cataract and our patients that we just see in the OPD, how we, how we should counsel them as general ophthalmologists. So quickly on history, one point that I'm looking at in this dull fovea is ask basically distortion. I think that is a leading question you to ask your patient. Close one eye, tada back at the extent key, I think it's a leading question. It's your optometrist or you may have not asked earlier. Once he's in the fundus and you see something not so right to the macula, specifically asked for distortion, 
see with the 7890d uh, in that is not good in this case and a direct of of the microscope does give you a magnified view but you might miss something that's not a binocular view you might get a simple shiny reflex also please compare both eyes whenever you see something in one eye which doesn't look right you know what i think the one is go back to see the other eye and come back to see eye again you might pick up a small hint over there you see a small gray appearance try and look at the smaller vessels over there at the macula the foveolar vascular zone area over there little outside that is there a small traction on them are they little tortuous then definitely show the amsa chart to your patient i think amsa chart should be there in all ophthalmic opds every ophthalmologist should keep the amsa chart it's a free piece of paper which you can keep but it's a very very effective piece of paper then comes the oct must do an oct the moment you find some distortion something not right something not fitting in so where would you do an oct six points i like to make one where the amount of cataract that you see in the vision loss don't match you are a good cataract surgeon and you know what the cataract is worth a 60 or a 636 and if that doesn't match the amount of cataract you see a vision which is lower than less than that do an oct it is my big patients with some vague complaints you know jhol jhol dekhchi tada baka dekhchi they tell you all the things at the same time apprehension also and some psychosomatic also and some actual clinical symptoms also uh this patient an oct is not a bad idea also a myopic patient prefer cataract surgery if in minimal doubt about the macular status i think it's a very good idea to uh, oct scan in these patients to have an idea what's ha- happening over there then it is next category of patients something like a 40 50 year old patient hardly any cataract nothing there they are not really demanding they are not really complaining and you see after a good refraction still vision is 66 so it's no cataract patient kichu gangan korche na but still not 66 it should set a bind in your mind why should this patient not see 66 What's wrong with the macula? And then you know, see if you can't figure something out. I'll re- refer to this point a little later on in my presentation. Sometimes we'll have diabetics with very few changes, some few hemorrhages here and there, some maybe a small membrane grayish, not CSME, not a bad idea to get a OCT on these patients or these so-called dry ARP patients where they are dry. There's also RP alteration. There's also elderly patients, but the reason is not so much to cause a 636 vision. Cataract is also less. Maybe you're looking at something other than the dry RMT, something on the retina itself, and so get an OCT done. And also, so I'll quickly go through a few slides of just photos over here. Uh, Dr. Sarup is my um, Kumar is my pointer present over there. Can you see my pointer? Okay. So something like this pointer. Now you know vision is less, but there are these three spots over here. You really don't know what the spots are. Then you go to the next one patient over here. See similar kind of spots over here. You do an OCT, and you know there's something wrong over here. This one thin line has become fusiform over here. So you're looking at probably a CNVM in a myopic patient. They don't really have too much of fluid. They don't bulge up. They don't have huge edemas over there. Very small, subtle finding that you look and do get over here. Um, all these series of photos that you have over here. Nice, thick, big CNVM. One small, chutku little thing over there. Hardly anything happening over here. Since so this is a diffuse, more more elongated one. This is one, and top of that, this B some edema over here. This is much easier to pick up. Sometimes you have a scar, and you don't know what you're looking at. This is a scar over here. This small finding over here is it a Drusen? Is it a CNVM? Probably a Drusen also, or here also a scar over here. These subtle small findings, CNVMs in myopic patients can be very minimal. Sometimes a 45 year old patient may have some cataract also, early cataract, and then you don't know what you're heading towards. So an OCT, these patients with pick up the small things may be a good idea. Fundus like this again, plus minus doing cataract surgery, not a bad idea. Some cracks, some things, some findings, some scar over here, not a bad idea to have an OCT done preoperatively. Also, if you have a clear cut hemorrhage over here, then there's no doubt that you're going to have a problem in this patient. If you don't do an OCT, if you miss this, saying this is a scar, you are in for big troubles. So you must have an OCT and treat this patient accordingly. Uh, just one last word on the OCT in myopia. This is an excellent article by the Atul Kumar and group. From Ames, and he's it's a very it's an article just two years old, and he says an insight to high myopia and macula. A lot of nice reading on this and OCT based article over here. Uh, this is one thing which is a uh, lot of us have been treating, doing some surgeries, not doing surgeries. This is a patient with a high fold over here, and this is a myopic traction maculopathy. A word being valid around the last four, five years, six years. We've been using this word a lot. MTM doing surgeries for this, either a buckle from outside behind the posterior globe. Or put going inside to give it to me and things. 
So a, a lesion like this, don't leave it alone. I would suggest if you get a osteolysis to send a VR person, let them take a call if they want to operate or not operate it on these patients. Uh, you could also have a very, moving on from here, to a very thin, hardly any finding kind of a minimal glistening reflex, nothing much happening over here. Of course, now in this patient, the other eye, you can make out there is some grayish thing here. The vessel is disappearing. Some grayish membrane over here. But vision is okay in this patient, so you really not bothered. But definitely get an OCT done because this might progress to something like this totally. Where you have a very obvious thick ERM membrane. Can't see the vessel at all. This patient needs definite intervention by the little person if they want to get it operated. So I would say just OCT here is definitely a must. And even in this case, should be an OCT to document what is there. Ah, this is another patient where I was talking about this Tortua City, the vessel, all these are pulled over here. You can make out these are small findings that you look for. And this looks like a hole and a membrane, but it's probably a pseudo hole. And because of thick membrane around over there, you can make out all these vessels tortures. You see this vessel is pulled down over here. This is what I'm referring to when I'm saying vessels are pulled towards the macula. These are small findings, but essentially good enough to give us an idea as to why the patient is seeing less. This is a clear cut macular hole traction, full thickness. <coughs> this is, you don't need to discuss much about this. Now, this is something I want today the general is to go back with at least one piece of information that this layer over here of the retina has some disruption over here. There is no traction over here, but this patient seeing less, probably get a written opinion, look at the patient carefully, <coughs> follow up the other eye also and see what is happening. Now, this is a patient of mine, uh, which was around 618, I think. And I said, yes, we can think of surgery. And the patient pulls out one OCT of uh, around eight months ago. And then I said, Acha, the then he pulls out another OCT of nearly four years ago, same OCT. And I'm like, you know, eating my words. And like 618 vision patients, says, sir, you have operation And I'm like, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, ma'am, sir, chart. And I have to take my word back. But this is something I think the general surgeons, they find something like this. They must send it to the retinal surgeon. This is the patient, how you want to progress. Good vision, distortion, age of the patient, <laughs> the right condition are different, different deciding factors. But this is something I would suggest that you actually tell the patient, most probably you need a surgery and send the patient away. This cannot be set left setting. This can be missed without, and this is sometimes very subtle finding on the retina. We do with the 70, 80 or 90D, but the OCT shows this. This needs attention for sure. And this will need different surgery, a different grade, there's no question of vitromacular traction like this. The earlier membranes, thick ERM membranes are different. A vitromacular traction like this causing so much of hole should have surgery in this patient. Uh, just to give you a perspective, this is a very, very nice article and a classification of vitromacular addition, traction, and macular hole. Different terminologies meaning different things. They have classifications, they have types, subsets. But if somebody wants to go into detail, this is a very good article published on three, four years back, maybe six, seven years back. It still holds good today also. <clears throat> Moving on, we have this ERM with this lamellar holes over here. Again, what to do, vision is good. Follow up your patient, Amsterdam chart. Uh, again, a lamellar hole like this, not a full thickness hole uh, with some ERM over here. Vision is good. Again, what to do. These are patients. This is a regenerative hole over here. This patient has some traction over here. Again, one needs to, you may not, you may just, this is a patient where you might have thought it's a cystic macula. Or cyst in the macula, but when you do the OCT, that is, you find these changes. You can have the subtle membrane you over want? here. You can have this, this membrane over here. And then there is this um, uh, nice article. What I'm trying to show over here is this very exotic group of Stanley Chang, and I mean, big, big shorts, big shorts for the, all of the world, which has paid. And even today, as of two years back, we are trying to discuss what the consensus should be for definition of a laminar macular hole. So if we, if you, as the general writers, lamellar hole, uh, pseudo hole, doesn't matter what you write. You are okay. Terminologies, don't worry. Don't don't mug up terminology. We don't need to get into that. We are ophthalmologists. You pick up something, follow up a patient or send it to somebody else, but don't miss doing the OCT over here for sure. Uh, again, this is a good good vision. Uh, I just showed this article, lamellar macular hole. Again, two distinct clinical entities. Again, dividing, subdividing. Degenerative type, tractional type. We can go into classifications like I showed earlier over here. There's an ERM over here. This patient does not have anything such thing. What to do? That's a traction type, it's a regenerative type. Real world, you'll have, or rather, these, these are the what you have real world. Attached all over, partially attached over here. Depending on what the vision is, we have to decide. <coughs> I'm quickly quoting a very good article of 
by uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Shitesh. He published this earlier this year on how he operates on lamellar macular holes, what he calls LHEP. It's a very nice article if anybody's interested. My last set of slides, this I would like you to go through very carefully. Please see here these small specs dots, 40, 45 year old patient, lady, fat, fertile, 40, female is what we call them. This small grayish stuff around over here, very subtle finding, very unhappy patient. Dr. Wood, last team was a charm, but Chosma is going to see if it could be that itself is an indication, hardly any character. That itself is an indication that this patient has some problem. And if you look at them, they follow them up. We'll have these small black pigments once in a while. And this, uh, the temporal part of here, this dark jet black pigment gives off a MACTEL, a macular telling tasia. But if you do a DFE, you have temporal leakage over here. And this very funny finding cystic changes in the OCT over here. This, again, the small change in the OCT over here. They have very, very unhappy patients. The findings clinically or OCT are very minimal compared to the come out of complaints that they tell you. <coughs> do not advise them injection anti reject They do not respond. It does not work over here. And this is not warranted for. So come back to my last two slides again. The amount of cataract and vision don't match to an OCT. Myopic patients, three catastrophic, they complete to an OCT. These, what are some of the macular telegraphy? These are patients which are less than 6'6. Six, six. These are patients who are not, you're not very sure what's happening to an OCT. Son as diabetic can have membranes, which look at the only the only the hemorrhage and leave them alone. Don't do that. Same with the ARM, elderly patients, very elderly patients. Look at the ARM. ARM. <coughs> I thank all my colleagues at NetLM and thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that very nice presentation. We loved seeing all your uh, images and it was a very lucid presentation. So um, I have a question for the chairman. Uh, Dr. P.N. Biswas, could you please unmute? Yes, sir. Sir, do you, um, what is your take on doing a routine OCT before cataract surgery? Do you advise a routine OCT for all your cataracts? Sir? Please re repeat, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I'm asking if uh, what's your take on routine OCT for cataract surgery? Do we uh, do OCT for all our patients? No, no, no. We we we, we see the uh, what what uh, Shorab said regarding the whether the vision is there is any tortuosity, any any irregularity in the vision. Uh, you see the Amsler chart. Show the Amsler chart. If there is some uh, distortion, so then in that case you have to go for OCT, and that that is very important. Otherwise. Uh, uh, see the amount of cataract, and then if there is uh, some problem, if you if you see the amount of cataract is less, but the vision is uh, not corresponding to it, then you have to go for OCT. These these are the few points uh, you have to take care. And there are so many uh, things has been discussed by Shoram, which are actually the, uh, that has to be taken care of by the uh, retinologist. And the general ophthalmologist should refer those cases who are having these problems. They, if they, they find any, pro, any, any uh, problem, uh, see that there is some defect in the macular area, then if they find, then they should refer the case to the retina specialist. That is the most important. They should not uh, go for the surgery they should explain and also I, I would advise to take a photograph uh, before the uh, cataract surgery because take a, a, a picture colored picture of the um, whole retina and show the patient that there is some problem I feel and you have to see the retinologist so then then you can you go for the OCT only if there is you find any findings uh, which is corroborating with that macular problem, which is that macula is dull, is there it in scar, anything that has to be explained to the patient first, and uh, that that has to be and then in those cases you have to do OCT and straightway show that this is the problem and. So we have some audio, audio issues. The surgery without explaining this 
then the patient will complain afterwards. That is a problem. So if you find, if you get general ophthalmologist should see that if there is some problem, if they suspect, then that has to be referred. They take the photograph, they say take the OCT and then refer the case. And the, the patient should be explained that this is the problem he is having or that is the thing. That is my advice. Thank you, sir. Uh, Zahir, Can sir, I, uh, yes, yes. yes I want to say something. Uh, based on my uh, previous uh, few years, sometimes some anterior segment cases have come from anterior segment uh, operated by anterior segment surgeons, and then there was some uh, retina problem which was not diagnosed before. And the patient has come and said, "Ki doctor, wabu uni to amake aage bolen ni. I was not told this before that I had this retina. He did this cataract, and now I can't see." So my take is uh, two things. Most important that one, the clinical examination, especially the fovea has to be seen uh, before the cataract surgery with, uh, you know, very carefully. But if the media is dense, then in that case, uh, we should explain that, see, the visual prognosis can be guarded. We are not able to see your retina properly. After the uh, surgery is done, we will see that. Otherwise, uh, just routinely doing a cataract, uh, before a cataract surgery, doing an OCT is not absolutely a bad idea. Because at times, you can come out with surprises. Like you did not expect an ERM to be there or a lamellar hole to be there due to the uh, hazy media. But then the OCT picks up that kind of a picture. And then you tell them, okay, yes, uh, see, apart from the cataract, there is some retina problem also. So from beforehand, the patient knows that, yes, there is an issue with the retina also that we are dealing with. And that uh, if for diabetic patients, if there is some amount of diabetic retinopathy, then getting an OCT done isn't at all a bad idea because some bit of fluid can be missed in, through a cataract aside. So uh, there, I know some uh, uh, anti-segment surgeons who routinely get it done. And uh, I have seen also some cases where we were not expecting any uh, foveal changes or macular changes, and they had been picked up by the OCT, which was not picked up clinically. Subtle findings. So uh, it's, uh, I think, not at all a bad idea. It's a very good question, sir. Yeah. Yeah, but Jairo, in, in mature cataract, what will you do? No, in mature cataracts can't do anything. Cannot see the obviously, uh, uh, guarded prognosis though from the first uh, hand so, only. So, guarded so what we can conclude is that probably we should have a very low threshold of doing OCT before cataract surgery. In case of any doubt, slightest of yes, doubt, yes, yes, slightest absolutely. of mismatch of cataract grade and vision, do a OCT. In today's yes, world, yes, so much of litigation, we should do it. Yes, yes. yes. So in, a, in, a, in an institute, is it a better idea to get all the uh, cataract patient uh, getting a retina checkup done by the retinologist prior to the cataract surgery? No, no I don't think that is uh, quite required. Because, 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 the, because the cataract surgeon might miss the peripheral retinal changes as well. So that's why I'm yes. asking. In an in so, institute, yeah. I am saying. I, I, uh, I think we should have a consensus uh, on this because uh, I do cataract and retina and it has happened a few times with me also. I missed uh, the VMT uh, and my optometrist, he asked to me after doing biometry, we have optical biometry and he picked up VMT on optical biometry. And then I did OCT and we have found VMT. And patient was asymptomatic, phobia appeared almost normal. We, we just missed it. So I think we should, it's a good debate and I think we should have a consensus on this. Whether we'll Actually, go for... I would prefer to get it done. If it is possible, we can devise a package where biometry, OCT and all that is done at a very low cost so that it doesn't financially trouble the patient also. And we are also on the safe side. We know what we are dealing with. So we don't have to do this explaining after cataract surgery. That's it. It's a very good idea. So, Saurav, sir, your... Uh, in I, I like the last yes, statement Rahit said, the patient shouldn't be burdened uh, because what happens sometimes is I have also seen, and pardon me for saying this, I have also seen very big, big ophthalmologists from Delhi, Bombay, who don't even see the retina want an OCT yes. and a full furnace yes. color photo, optos color photo, which also is, I think, a bit too much. Too much. Another extreme. Right. Let's not get to that extreme also. Yes. So, it's a problem. I mentioned the six points that I think they're very valid for six points. Yes. It is doubt both threshold like Dr. Kumar Sahib said. But telling my colleague at a general ophthalmologist that every patient should have an OCT, I don't agree with that. No. If you do it of cost, I'm okay with that. Yes. I'm okay with that. Or at a very low cost, I'm okay with that. The every yes. patient should be seen with a 78 or 90 diopter lens. That's the yes. must. Yes. yes. 
I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, since we don't have any more questions, we would like to go to the next uh, talk. That is by Dr. Rupa Roy. He will be dealing with uh, retinal hemorrhage, what it could be. So, on to you, sir. Is my slide visible? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sneha, uh, Dr. Sardov. Uh, thank you to SWB and Shuvatada for this opportunity. Uh, my topic is retinal hemorrhages, what it could be. So it's a very basic uh, presentation that I'm going to make on the various facets of retinal hemorrhages. So before we go into uh, the presentation per se, I'll be uh, dividing the retinal hemorrhages as per their morphology, uh, the layer of the retina they affect, the location of the hemorrhages within the retina and etiology of the retinal hemorrhages. So these are the broad guidelines. Whenever you encounter a patient with retinal hemorrhage, you have to identify the patients or categorize the hemorrhage into these broad categories, which helps us to come in in a clinical diagnosis. So morphologically, it could be microaneurysm, it could be dot hemorrhages or blot hemorrhages. It could be flame shepherd hemorrhages, uh, disc hemorrhages, uh, rot spots, and finally old uh, hemorrhages. So a uh, single red dot or microaneurysm is the commonest uh, that we encounter. Uh, it is commonest in diabetic retinopathy, but we must remember that it is also seen in vascular occlusions, hypertension, and radiation retinopathy. So the presence of a single retinal hemorrhage puts the patient in the grade of a non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and heart weakener of a Watson disease. So it is very important to pick up a small red dots, which are best picked up by 78 diopter examination. As, as the disease progresses, uh, we can see affection of the deeper capillary layers where the hemorrhages uh, assume a circular shape. And these are basically dot and blot hemorrhages. Uh, they are seen in diabetic retinopathy and vascular occlusions. So unlike a single dot in microaneurysms, the blot hemorrhages are uh, circular and a little wider in diameter. They implicate affection of the deeper layers of the retina. Uh, flame shepherd hemorrhages, these are flame shepherd hemorrhages, which are uh, like flames. They affect the superficial nerve fiber layer. Whenever you see a patient with flame shepherd hemorrhage, you think of uh, the patient is having, uh, whether the patient is having hypertension, and this is also common in blood dyscrasias. So types of hemorrhage sometimes helps us to identify the disease process that is going inside. If you see microaneurysms, you think of diabetic retinopathy. If you see dot and blot hemorrhages, you can think of uh, vascular occlusions and diabetic retinopathy. In the same vein, if you see a flame shepherd hemorrhage, you think in the lines of hypertensive retinopathy. These yes, hemorrhages are uh, quite common. These are peripapal hemorrhages, superficial hemorrhages. These are uh, not per se uh, hemorrhages due to a retinal condition. They are autochromic of glaucomatous damage. Roth spot are basically white centered hemorrhages. You can see these are hemorrhages with center. A center white portion. The whiteness of this is due to a fibrin coagulum. They are uh, uh, they are suggestive of infective endocarditis or blood dyscrasias. So whenever you see a patient with a with a hemorrhage with a rot spot, you think of infective endocarditis or some kind of blood dyscrasias, and your uh, blood investigations and other systemic investigations should be tailored to find out these causes. It is also important to understand or uh, realize how old hemorrhages look. Uh, these are uh, this this is a case of a retinal microaneurysm with an old subretinal hemorrhage. You can see the vessel is passing over this whitish area. So old hemorrhages sometimes uh, can have confusing uh, clinical picture, but this is how an old hemorrhage look like. They are whitish because of the dehemoglobinized blood. This is another uh, example of a patient with an old hemorrhage. You can see that hemorrhage in the superficial layers. 
and you can see the dehemoglobinized blood. So this is also important to identify this pattern to know about the old hemorrhage. Coming to layer-wise analysis, we can have uh, hemorrhages in the sub-ILM layer, uh, the pre-retinal hemorrhage, the intra-retinal hemorrhage, sub-retinal and the sub-RP hemorrhage. So sub-ILM hemorrhage is uh, commonly seen in conditions like valsalpa retropathy. Uh, this is a case of valsalpa retropathy where you see a large amount of uh, ILM hemorrhage. Uh, and other, the, other, the other eye is usually normal and other parts of retina does not manifest any finding. These are very wonderfully uh, treated with YAG hyaluronotomy. Here the YAG hyaluronotomy is done and you can see the drainage of the blood. Also sub-ILM hemorrhage is seen in uh, blood dyscrasias, but the difference from, um, uh, from a Valsalva retinopathy would be multifocal in nature, bilateral distribution, and the blood workup will be diagnostic to pick up sub-ILM hemorrhage. So when you see a patient with sub-ILM or superficial hemorrhage, you think of uh, a, a blood dyscrasia or a Valsalva. Pre-retinal hemorrhage is, uh, or rather sub -hyloid just below, below the hyaloid layer. This is a hemorrhage that you should be very wary of. This is an ominous sign. This is a hemorrhage which occurs due to retinal neovascularization. This, they can occur in diabetic retinopathy, vascular occlusion. Whenever you see hemorrhage like this, you know this is a patient who has a retinal neovascularization and needs urgent treatment in the form of laser. Otherwise, this patient can develop vitreous hemorrhage very fast or they can develop fibrovascular proliferations. This is a typical board shepherd configuration of pre-retinal hemorrhage that we see in a diabetic patient. Whenever you see such a board shepherd configuration in a diabetic patient, you know the patient has progressed to a proliferative stage and needs laser treatment. So again, pattern identification is very important. This pattern of board shepherd hemorrhage is very important to identify. Intraretinal hemorrhages like this are seen in uh, diabetic retinopathy, vascular occlusion, or hypertensive retinopathy. This is a case of uh, subretinal hemorrhage. How to identify that it's a subretinal hemorrhage? It is very easy. You can trace the vessels over the hemorrhage. You can see this is the blood vessel, which is traceable uh, nicely over the hemorrhage. Again, you can see this blood vessel over the hemorrhage, so you know this is a subretinal hemorrhage. This is commonly seen in choroidal neovascular membranes, trauma, polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So you know whenever you see a patient with subretinal hemorrhage, if you are able to rule out trauma, you are probably dealing with uh, uh, ARMD-related, neovascular ARMD-related pathology. Uh, Sub-RP hemorrhage are usually deeper in location, dark brown in color. This is a subretinal hemorrhage superficially. In the center, you can see a sub-RP hemorrhage. Again, OCT is very helpful in differentiation between a subretinal and a sub-RP hemorrhage. Uh, common causes would be a CNVM or a PCV. Uh, now, if you, uh, if I come to the next, next sub-analysis of my topic, how to differentiate hemorrhages uh, on location-wise, they can have a localized affection. They can affect single quadrant, hemi-quadrants, or all four quadrants. Now, this is very simple. If you see a hemorrhage just within the, within the macula, uh, just involving one quadrant, you know you are dealing with a tributary venous occlusion. Uh, on the contrary, you can have uh, hemorrhages along the uh, uh, drainage area of one vein. And in a single quadrant, you know, we are dealing with a, a branch retinal venous occlusion, which typically involves a single quadrant. On the other hand, you can have involvement of the half of the retina. Here you can see the superior half of the retina is involved with intraretinal hemorrhages. This is a case of hemi-RVO or hemi-retinal vein occlusion. And finally, you have a central retinal vein occlusion where uh, all the quadrants are, are usually affected. Now, coming to my last uh, uh, last uh, sub-analysis, that is how to differentiate them on the basis of etiology. We can The commonest etiology where you have retinal hemorrhages are diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, vascular occlusions we have obviously discussed, retinal artery macroaneurysm and ocular ischemic syndrome. So, uh, diabetic retinopathy is a very common clinical condition. Remember, it will present with uh, hemorrhages, microaneurysms, and, uh, and hard exudates, a typical moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which can be confused with a hypertensive retinopathy, 
but the key differentiation would be preponderance of uh, cotton wool spots in cases of uh, uh, hypertensive retinopathy, which is not very common in diabetic retinopathy. It can happen though. And the distribution of hard exudates in a macular star pattern in hypertensive retinopathy and AV crossing changes, which can be seen in hypertensive retinopathy. So basically, diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy can coexist, give, give rise a clinical picture of mixed retinopathy also. But remember, diabetic retinopathy will have preponderance of hard exudates and hemorrhage, and hypertensive retinopathy will have more of cotton spots, hemorrhages, and AV crossing changes. Retinal artery macroaneurysm is another disease where you can see hemorrhages in all the layers of retina. So this is a case of retinal artery macroaneurysm. You can see there is pre-retinal hemorrhage and subretinal hemorrhage. So whenever you see a patient with uh, both a subretinal hemorrhage component and a pre-retinal or intra-retinal hemorrhages, you think of retinal arterial macroaneurysm. This is one co common condition which gives rise to multi-level uh, hemorrhages apart from trauma. Ocular ischemic syndrome is another uh, subtle clinical condition where you can see uh, mid peripheral hemorrhages uh, dilated but not tortuous vessels, mostly most commonly caused by carotid insufficiency. Must be differentiated from non ischemic CRV. This is a patient of non ischemic CRV which have mild hemorrhages but throughout the retina, and you can see the vessels are tortuous as well as dilated. So, retinal hemorrhages are pathognomic pattern. Uh, uh, pattern recognition is important to identify disease. They follow patterns which help in disease identification. But the most important thing is a single hemorrhage in retina warrants a thorough systemic evaluation. No retina, no healthy retina should, uh, healthy uh, human being should have a hemorrhage in a retina. So even a single spot of hemorrhage in retina warrants a thorough systemic evaluation. Thank you for your patience here. Thank you, Dr. Rupak, for the elaborate talk. So do we have any questions? Uh, uh, I would like to have the, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Subandhu Boral. Uh, um, sir, can you uh, take up your question? So, so there was one question like, suppose in a patient who is non-diabetic, non-hypertensive and 45 years old, and he has retinal hemorrhages in both of his eyes, both his eyes, multiple retinal hemorrhages and no other thing. He is non-diabetic and non-hypertensive. So how should we investigate? How, what should we do for these such cases, such eyes, such patients? Or uh, if we can reframe the question, like if the patient is has not been tested for diabetes, has not been an hypertensive patient, and he has hemorrhages, then apart from diabetes and uh, hypertension, what all do we suspect? Should we suspect? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Rupak, you can only uh, take the question. Yeah. So it's uh, so bilateral hemorrhages. If you see hemorrhages in both eyes. Uh, we know that we are dealing with a patient with a systemic condition. Uh, uh, the conditions which can lead to bilateral hemorrhages obviously are uh, the commonest would be a diabetic retinopathy, which I'd investigate for diabetes. Um, and hypertension, uh, vascular occlusions can have bilateral hemorrhages. And finally, blood dyscrasias can have bilateral uh, hemorrhages. So these are the commonest four situations where we can have bilateral hemorrhages. Whenever a disease presents bilaterally, we, we suspect there is something going on systemically. So we uh, investigate the patient on systemic lines. And will your investigations change if the patient was, say, around below 40 years of age, like 38, 37, 35 years of age? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I would like to go for more detailed analysis for less than 35 or 30 year patients like homocysteine, a coagulation profile, a lapla, so uh, any autoimmune disorder. This thing should be looked into uh, any protein C, protein S deficiency, any coagulopathies. This, this thing should be stressed upon, which, which we generally call as second line investigation. This things I will try to look into if I'm dealing with the similar uh, situation in patient younger than 40 years of age. More than 40, I'll think in lines of diabetes, hypertension, vascular occlusion, like that. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I just want to add, so we must not, uh, just, like you said, blood discretious. Uh, I think in all of our retinologists have some time, point in our career have come across patients who had uh, uh, leukemias and uh, they had come with bilateral retinal hemorrhages or severe anemias. 
and uh, my, i myself have found leukemia and patient was not aware a peripheral blood smear in that situation is very important and must not be forgotten younger patients coming with bilateral retinal hemorrhages peripheral uh, blood smear apart from what rupak said is very important yes yes thank you so uh, we have uh, one raised hand of dr puspita sau ma'am ma'am uh, will you uh, ask your question please this has got nothing to do with this topic this hand has been raised for a long time <laughs> my question is to shorab and all your retinologists right we have been just told that in any lattice degeneration so we have to go back a long way we're going back to that uh, speak speech any lattice degeneration with or without atrophic hole when you're going for cataract surgery you need to have laser okay understood what about any lattice or any lattice with atrophic holes which we come in a routine investigation in asymptomatic patients young patients who are not undergoing surgery right there what is your take on the lattice degenerations that you see on a routine examination in patients ma'am uh, can i take that question i tell so the patient i tell the patients frankly uh, like uh, what we have in oswb is a divided house to be very honest i tell no, no, them no. also that uh, there are two schools of thought one believe that uh, asymptomatic patients uh, we can observe and uh, not do anything but uh, me i personally would prefer to do barrage if there is a frank hole in that uh, retina right, exactly. uh, with lattice because i because many a time we have seen young patients coming with rds asymptomatic before no uh, flashes no floaters but with a retina detachment so that exactly. is why i, I prefer yeah. to do right. laser right i asked your opinion not the divided opinion or whatever <laughs> but yeah. my thing is we have seen we are pretty old we have seen cases over years i have personally followed up many cases asymptomatic with lattice i have seen them once a year and they have of course if they are going in for any surgery refractive or otherwise then you need to treat that but otherwise any lattice asymptomatic that you see with atrophic holes we have been taught i don't know what uh, youngsters are following now is to observe them if there is change etc or if there is symptom producing or if there is a detachment in the other eye then to treat it because excessive treatment of lattice lattice can also lead to problem लाइन <laughs> One is Lovely. you want a scientific evidence based answer, or do you want a practical answer, or are they no, different? No, I no no no. I want from your experience to tell me that you have seen patients who are young patients. No, so, ma'am. Then I will go by what you said. I will go by what you said. Yeah. Lattices with nothing in them, absolute follow up with a hole, plus minus, uh, depending on how the other eye is. How many holes there are? I again go to say there are two, three rows of lattices in both eyes. I don't treat them because I'm very scared of inducing vitreous vitreous problem. A single lattice, some hole here and there, possibly. I also treat if I have multiple lattices, one lattice, one hole. I treat only that lattice with the hole. It's a very personalized difference of opinions. But true to what you said, most lattices can be followed up for years without any exactly. Injury. There is no doubt things have not changed. No. This no, thing is a very gold standard. Right. This is what I'm trying to say. You know, from from all the speeches, for us comprehensive ophthalmologists, we have sudden. You know, we have spoken about cataract surgery with pre-existing lattice, and let us not take this message that any lattice that you see in any stage of your life that you need to have need to refer to a retina specialist and get it done, because I have seen lattice with excessive treatment. What problem has happened? So one more thing which That's we right. can add, ma'am, uh, ma'am, add here that if the patient has a family history of retinal detachment, then even when the lattice looks very innocuous, doesn't look, doesn't have any. That's hole, a different issue. Then, then he, that is a issue. different issue. Yeah. That is a different issue. My question was not that a detachment in the other eye with the family history of detachment. Those are those are you know that needs treatment. That needs. That's a different thing. 
thank you thank you thank you ma'am so next speaker i would like to invite so, dr uh, we have a, a raised hand dr shoman so uh yeah i uh, may i just ship in once uh, part of uh, it is a part of what i was going to say was already been uh, discussed right now by dr saurav and the other thing is for general ophthalmologists uh, what i would think is uh, if you see a lattice and with an atrophic hole maybe even if you don't go for a retina examination a retina to a retinologist or you don't go for a, a laser Uh, after the cataract surgery, do follow up the patient with an IO, if possible. Even if you are not sending the patient to a retinologist, because yeah, uh, because uh, there might be a uh, PVD after the uh, cataract has uh, been taken care of. So, and if there's any change in the character of the lattice, then you can send the patient for laser. That's uh, it. Sh Shomin, to add yeah. to what you just said. anybody who wants needs to have a cataract surgery i would advise them to have the lattice treated beforehand i was not talking of that issue okay no, uh, any any so, any cataract surgery or any refractive surgery no you needn't no you needn't even if so, you, if you have think, an inocuous I lattice i think so, we'll 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 we'll, 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 we'll move on sir we'll come back with that the next talk yeah. let's, let's, okay 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 rather i would say what shobhan said if you have a pc rain if you have a pc rain Lattice, no lattice. One month of care, see the retina carefully. Absolutely, right. agreed. That's the most important thing. Agreed, hundred percent. Forget lattice, no lattice. We have a PC rain after one month, two months. Please check the retina very carefully. That is the more important issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on table also, if possible. Are you? Are you going to tell? So let us move on, sir. So the next speaker is Dr. Anirudh Dhomaiti. Uh, we will be talking about membranes in the macula and how to approach that. Uh, thank you, Shuro. Uh, my presentation is visible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, well, I will be talking the membrane and the macula. Uh, how to approach back to membranes after Shuro of them? Well, membranes in the macula they are epiretinal membranes and subretinal membranes. The already epiretinal membrane Shuro of that has uh, described in details and what to how to go about it. So I will be dealing with the subretinal membrane mainly the CNVMs. well coming to the diagnosis i think the first thing which should come into our mind is the history a very typical history of a small region of the central blurring of vision with distortion this is a, a typical history given by the patient a history of smoking can be there or may not be there and in the sleepman uh, by microscope whether 90 d or 78 d we can actually see the membrane but when in doubt obviously the oct gives us confirms the diagnosis at times whether oct also we are not very sure we cannot confirm the diagnosis that is where we need to do an angiography uh the fluorescent angiography and in few cases we need to do an icg angiography and it was been discussed in the previous talks if there is a dense cataract and a hazy media yes uh, it is difficult to see whether there is a membrane or not but a clue to its diagnosis like we need to see the fellow eye for the armd changes and sometimes actually the b scan also can pick up membranes as you can see in this picture but it is not always we can pick up the uh, cnv membrane through b scan now clinical diagnosis is the most important we can see in membrane we can see pds or an hemorrhage so most important is clinically diagnose the patient and especially when this patients the cataract is not correlating with a visual loss so this should be uh, we should keep in mind and then uh, we should diagnose with the uh, fund, uh, uh, the fundus lenses whether there is something wrong in the macula i think the oct uh, whether we should do in all cases or not we have a lot of discussion but definitely when we get pictures like this confluent dusen or a geographical atrophy we need to see whether there is some fluid inside so whether the lesion is active or not especially when there is a uh, there is a clump of soft uh, drusens uh, uh, we need to rule out whether they are only drusens or it's a wet md definitely 
uh, with the OCT, it is very easy to diagnose whether there's a presence of a membrane. Uh, this in the first picture, we see a choroidal neovascular membrane with SRF, obviously an active lesion which needs to be treated. Whether we can see a multiple PEDs with SRF or a little bit of hyperreflectivity just beneath the uh, PED, which is an uh, allied lesion to AMD, the RAP lesion. And these are the cases you can see in the, uh, we need to do an angiography. We are not very sure whether it's active or not. When we do an angiography, this ne next three pictures actually gives an idea whether it's an active or not. This is a typical picture of a classic CNV. On the other hand, you see an PED with a hemorrhage surrounding it. Uh, and when we do an angiography, we see the hyperfluorescence and the later cells. So this is an occult CNVM. Sometimes uh, in the first picture, we are pretty clear with an angiography, this is an active membrane, but there will be cases where with the angiograph also, we are not very confirmed. We cannot pick up the membrane. As you can see in the second set of pictures, the hemorrhage is there, but in, with an angiograph also, we don't find any leakage. And the third set also, there is hyperfluorescent area, but not a very typical leakage like what we see in a membrane. So here the case uh, we need to do, these are the case we need to do an ICG angiogram. You can see a confluent soft drosen in an angiogram, fluorescent angiogram. We are not able to pick up the membrane. When we do an ICG angiogram, we look at an hot spot. So there will be cases where we need to do ICG angiogram. In the second set of pictures, just shown in the previous slide, it's just a block fluorescence with a little bit of uh, hyperfluorescence from undetermined sources. When we do the ICG, we see a, a, a cluster of polyps, which actually gives an idea that this is a PCV case. And the third set here, it was not very sure there was hyperfluorescence, but when we do an uh, ICG, we look at the hotspot. So this is the investigation which needs to be done. Definitely not in all cases, but in some cases we need to do the uh, ICG angiogram as well. Soft drusens, we need to follow up for progression. As mentioned by Shorabda, the Amsler is a very good uh, tool to detect whether there's some uh, distortion of vision or not. This is a risk scale for the progression of ARMD. These are the patient we need to be followed up. It is not only the presence of drusen. If there's a presence of a large drusen or a pigmentary change which is categorized numbered as one, uh, both the eyes, uh, it is the presence of large drusen is categorized as factor one or the pigmentary changes and other factors. So if, if there is only one factor, the risk of progression to advance AMD is only 3%. But if both the eyes have large drusens and pigmentary changes, which, uh, which actually is a four factors, which says there is a 50% chance of progression to advanced AMD. So this thing should be kept in mind while we are following up a patient of only person, not a member. The real world uh, experience, especially during the COVID times, the Amsler actually helps a lot. This is a patient which, which was seen in 2019. It was a CNVM in the left eye. The right eye only person was there. This patient was given an Amsler in 2021. Even amongst the, uh, in, in the midst of COVID, he realized that distortion has appeared in the right eye also. When he came to the hospital, he was detected with AMD, active AMD. So uh, coming to the recent advances, yes, uh, uh, although we can't say the spectral domain is a recent advances, uh, but uh, the, there definitely has a lot of advantage over the time domain, even subtle membranes and interretinal fluid might be missed in a domain, which will be picked up in a spectral domain OCT. And there will be cases, a few cases where there will be a clinical suspicion, but OCT uh, is almost normal. If we do an octa, we can pick up the membranes. So the points you considered, what would you refer, when would you refer the cases when it is presented to your practice? Yes. Again, repeating sort of this word, cataract can wait. We need to treat the AMD, the subretinal membrane first. And then when it is settled, stabilized, then go back and do the cataract. And what management uh, might be considered? There are many options of treatment, mostly are not practiced nowadays. What we do is 
mostly the anti vagus monotherapy and a few cases the extrafovea lesions we can try with a direct photocoagulation you can see the various cases of amds subretinal membrane been treated with monotherapy and doing pretty well surgical management reserved for subretinal hemorrhage not going into the details so the take home message a proper history taking is mandatory from the history only we can pick up the at least we can clinically there should be a suspicious of subretinal membrane clinical examination will give up the diagnosis prom treatment should be initiated obviously oct and dfa needs to be done in some cases and mostly the oct uh, gives us the uh, information any anti vagus is good enough there is lot of studies showing that all anti vagus do work whether mostly what we do is a loading dose followed by the pnr therapy and the most important is the soft dose sense we need to follow up and look up thank you thank you sir for that talk um i would like to ask a question uh, first of all there are few lattice related questions uh i would i would uh, um uh like to take that up uh, with the panelists and all the speakers after the session is over and regarding this talk i had a question for dr ashim kumar ghosh so um okay, can we and yes so um uh, Neha, can you please mute everyone else, please? Yes, sir. There's a lot of background noise. So, uh, Doctor Ghosh, can unmute yourself. Oshimda, please unmute yourself. So, for CNVM patients, uh, which is a uh, better option? Should we uh, do an octa or a DFA? Uh, definitely, octa has got much more. Uh, favorable uh, investigation and also conclusive investigation than dfa and uh, it is the talk which is relevant to the general comprehensive ophthalmologist if any suspected lesion not only to say that there is some history which is suggestive from macular uh, conditions like bizarre pattern of images or anything else before that or any other drusen in the other eye which is also conclusive for the persistence new vascular md here with the cataract so that uh, um, it is better uh, not to uh, not to waste the time for general ophthalmologist uh, or comprehensive ophthalmologist to take the patient under their care so it should be referred to the retinologist and they will decide the proper investigations and also do the proper treatment so that the scarring will be prevented and the ultimate some amount of vision will be obtained i think so okay sir so another uh, yes sir sorry sir so you can unmute yourself and in normal routine cnvm cases i don't think uh, we have to do uh, dye based angiography though octa is not available in all institutions <laughs> but only when the oct is suggestive of pcb type of lesions in those cases i strongly suggest that both a combined dfa icg that is possible in heidelberg should be done because a lot changes if there is a pcb component to the cnvm i, the, I think but, I, we should add another indication that is a myopic cnvm with the oct alone we cannot diagnose at times we have to do yes. an yes right uh related to the membranes uh, so another question would be how you follow up patients with erm who do not require uh, immediate operation like a uh, good vision and a mild erm so what is your follow up protocol i i think the erm the patient patient should be symptomatic if the patient is not symptomatic we the, he will never be happy after the surgery yes there is symptomatic sometimes six nine patients are also symptomatic so symptoms should be uh, uh, criteria for uh, deciding whether to go for surgery or not so in case of an asymptomatic patient how would you like to follow up that patient what would be your follow up uh, regime Generally, asymptomatic treat and if there is distortion or the increase in distortion then i ask the patient to report and then we take a call i'll i'll, I'll just uh, if i may speak 
Yes, sir. If it's an intelligent, sharp patient who initially came with this confused idea about the distortion, I explained the whole funda of ERM, laminar hole, BMT, and I know it makes no sense. It will come back in a month's time. So they've done. They've visited Doctor Google in the meantime, and Doctor Google has told them a lot of things. So in that month back, later, a little bit more organized in the home Amsterdam thing. I don't need it really just for counseling the patient. But you need regular follow-ups. And then I come back, come back in two months' time, you know, and meet me anytime you want. I know it, it's, nothing's going to happen in two months' time. But I tell them, if you have increased distortion, do come back. I become very aggressive about it because then they can't blame me for calling them back four months later because nothing's going to happen in four months' time. So it's the point is, as a retina person, if you uh, answer the question for a general phonologist, if you're seeing a patient diagnosing for the first time, call them back a little earlier, maybe two to three months' time. If it's been there for a very long time and it's not really changing and it's not a very demanding patient, maybe four to six months is a good enough gap. Okay. Yes, sir. That is a huge I, would, I would want to reframe Sneha's question. Same thing, instead of a mild ERM, if the ERM is uh, pretty worse, vision is still 6-9, but there is complete flattening of the contour and, you know, kind of a outer lamellar hole kind of a picture, retina getting kind of lifted up. That is a more tricky situation I because Zai, patient vision is still 6-9. I, I think, Zai, here also we need to consult, we discuss with the patient and let the patient Yes. yes. Uh, we have some questions regarding PVR and uh, lattice. We'll take it up later. Uh, so we go, go on to our next talk. So it's by Dr. Pranab Das. So I would like you to unmute and uh, share your screen. He'll be talking about what to look before traumatic cataract surgery. Thank you, Sneha. I will be speaking on what to look for, for before traumatic cataract surgery. The crystalline lens is damaged in large number of cases with ocular trauma. It ranges from 27 to 65% of the patients. And the traumatic cataract is one of the major cause of acute and uh, long-standing visual loss after the trauma. And we know that cataract surgery for traumatic cataract is far more complex than the standard cataract surgery due to potential pre-existing damage to the uh, capsule or genules, leading to a greater risk of intraoperative lens dislocation capsular back violation, and possible vitreous loss. Damage to the other ocular structure can complicate steps of the surgery. Corneal, like corneal scars may impair the visibility. Vitreous hemorrhage may uh, darken or prevent the red reflex. Vitreous prolapse may necessitate the additional surgical step. A damage to the iris can result in intraoperative floppy iris or uh, uh, the people expander like um, mulligan ring or iris hoops. So while evaluating a patient of traumatic cataract, uh, uh, we should be thoroughly investigating the patient. It st start from a careful history, which is very ex extremely important. We should have targeted history uh, about the circumstances of injury, how it happened, uh, what is the force uh, uh, implied, and it sh the, the history should uh, give us the idea uh, what are the structure potentially can be involved in this particular injury and the degree of structural damage and possibility of retained in, uh, for, uh, foreign body. And we should carefully review the past medical record. Wherever the patient was earlier treated, we should go through the uh, record in detail. Especially, uh, we should note the, what was the zone of injury. This is, this is because the zone of injury is very much uh, important as far as the prognosis of the uh, cataract surgery is involved. If, if it is involving the zone three, we know that that means beyond uh, five millimeter of the limbus, and there is high possibility of the posterior segment trauma, even if it is open in, uh, open in, uh, <clears throat> globe injury. So that should we should always uh, go through the record in detail. And when we are doing a primary repair, we should uh, record it in clear language or in draw a diagram to uh, show the extent of the injury. And then we should uh, see the, uh, the other uh, the information provided by the primary uh, physician, or primary ophthalmologist, what he has noted in the, uh, the initial visit, because that may be the only time when the, 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 the uh, media was clear or we could see the retina, because the cataract has not progressed, the vitreous hemorrhage has, has not uh, dispersed. So that will also give us fair idea what was the uh, structural damage in the posterior segment. 
Coming to the examination, it should start from the external examination to the face and lead. We should record the visual acuity. Pupillary examination is very, very important. Uh, we should note the whether there is a sphincter damage or not, whether there is a, uh, what is the uh, light reaction is not uh, there or not, whether there is any presence of uh, RAPD or not. And we should never uh, ignore the extraocular motility. Sometimes the traumatic cataract may be associated with the uh, orbital floor fracture leading to the restriction of the ocular movement. Once you remove the cataract, there may be diplopia. So we should not ignore that part also. Routinely, we don't see these uh, things uh, in uh, senile cataract surgery. And in slit lamp examination, we should be uh, examining the anterior segment in detail. IOP is very important because uh, the, the traumatic cataract can be associated with the high IOP or low IOP. In high IOP, probably because of uh, damage to the angle structure, high femur, or other thing. And the low IOP could be because of cyclodialysis, which need attention before the cataract surgery. And we should do gonioscopy for the, all the patients uh, to note the extent of the uh, angle damage, that will give us idea how, whether there is genular uh, dehiscence or not. Sometimes we see the genular dehiscence, extent of genular dehiscence if, if the people is well dilated with the gonioscopy and obviously the fundus examination. In case of blunt trauma, location of impact is very important. And we know that trauma to the temporal brow region can lead to the traumatic optic uh, nerve contusion and impact to the malar region can lead to the orbital floor fracture. This is one case where you can see this, it's, uh, three to 40 weeks after the trauma, uh, this patient has uh, obvious brow injury, uh, the road traffic accident, there is a dissolving subparental hemorrhage along with cataract, and then we can see that this optic disc pale within a, within a month or so. So the location of the scar or uh, the uh, trauma will give you an idea, fair idea what we are going to see inside the fundus. And next we should uh, evaluate the genuine. So uh, while we're examining the slit lamp, we should try to quantify the what amount of genular dehiscence is there and whether the lens is already dislocated or not. Sometimes in slit lamp examination, we might be thinking that this uh, this case can be amenable to the FECO calcification with CTR or other devices. But when you examine the patient in supine position, especially those where the, the, the inferior uh, genular dialysis is there, the lens is actually hanging from the superior intact genules. When you make the patient in supine position, the lens is actually hanging to the vitreous cavity from the superior uh, uh, genular attachment. So there you have to go for lensectomy. So this is very important. When there is inferior genular laxity or dehiscence, you should make the patient in supine position to examine the dislocation of uh, the lens. Sometimes a traumatic cataract is associated with the posterior sinaiki. Here, if the, even if there is genular dehiscence, you may not appreciate with the slit lamp examination. You, you, you need to evaluate with the imaging. Uh, uh, imaging. The UBM is a, a great device to note the uh, this kind of genular uh, status in a post-traumatic cataract cases. It actually identifies the presence of any genular defects and quantify it. Even a stretching can be uh, identified with the UBM. And then it will help us in formulating the optimal surgical plan and avoid any untoward surgical procedures. So this is a study which has nicely shown that they have studied 143 eyes of the uh, 143 patients with ocular trauma. What they found in uh, genular uh, damage was found in 55.2.2 percent of the patients, including genular tears in 33 percent patient and genular stretch in 22 percent patient. Obviously, genular damage was much more in blunt trauma than the penetrating trauma. So these are the few UVM picture where they have evaluated the genular status, but there was media opacity or could not see the slit lamp. We can see on the left-hand side top photograph, there is, uh, there is a gap between the ciliary body and the lens equator. So there is a genular dehiscence. On the right-hand side top photograph, there is a uh, there's an increased gap between the uh, between the ciliary body and the, uh, and the uh, equator of the lens and the stretching of the genus. And you can identify other associated injuries like in the button photograph, you can see that there is a iridodialysis with the genular stress. And other pathologies also can be identified with the UBM. Here you can see this uh, left-hand side top photograph, there is an angle recession. There is uh, the middle one is the cyclodialysis along, along with the uh, detachment of the ciliary body. And, and down photograph, there is a arrow showing the um, metallic foreign body. 
So another thing we have to note whether the posterior capsule is intact or not. The, this is not very uncommon to see the posterior capsule rupture in blunt trauma. So uh, pre-operative awareness about the pre-existing PC defect is very crucial for the intraoperative management. It can help in proper counseling of the patient regarding the surgical difficulties and help the surgeon in making the proper sized anterior capsule axis for ciliary fixation of the eye well. Hyd uh, hydro procedure one can avoid if you know that there is a PC rupture pre-existing rupture, the principle of closed chamber technique is followed to minimize the vitreous loss and hence the posterior segment complication. Uh, clinically, we suspect uh, PC rupture when there is deep anterior chamber with flat anterior capsule and sinking cortex. But at times it is not possible to determine whether the PC is intact or not, then we, we can go for ultrasound. We can see in the ultrasound, there is uh, some protruding material beyond the outline, behind the outline of posterior capsule. And it is nicely seen in UBM and, and the right hand side uh, photograph. You can see the, uh, the, the PC is uh, disrupted at the center part of the uh, posterior capsule and with, along with the lens matter be, uh, behind that. So we can uh, do an UBM or ultrasound to evaluate the posterior capsule before going for cataract surgery to avoid the unnecessary um, embarrassment during the surgery or uh, to be better planned for the surgery. And we should note the morphology of cataract, uh, what type of, type of cataract we're dealing with. The right-hand side photograph, you can see this membranous cataract. Yet we have to go for a membranectomy, either through the limb, uh, limbal approach or the parse plan approach along with the anterior vitrectomy. And the left-hand side photograph, you can see the uh, soft uh, cataract. We can simply aspirate with the IA or uh, we can do FACO aspiration. So uh, knowing morphology is also important before going for the cataract surgery. And sometimes cataract uh, is a very uh, localized one in the periphery. It's not disturbing the vision. We can just observe because this kind of cataract uh, may be static one. It may not progress, so may, may, may avoid surgery. And we need to know what are the other uh, associated uh, trauma. Sometimes we can miss the inter interlanticular foreign body. So history is very important. Looking for tiny corneal um, wound is very important. Uh, we, we should suspect the... Uh, Intraocular, retain intraocular foreign body either in the lens or in the posterior segment. So you should investigate accordingly. Coming to the posterior segment evaluation, uh, this is very important. And by the time the cataract develops, uh, comes to the uh, surgeon, we may not be actually um, knowing what is the posterior segment status. Uh, if we can see, uh, uh, we should uh, try to look at the following findings in case of blunt trauma, like vitreous hemorrhage, commotion, retinic, cordial rupture, submacular hemorrhage, macular hole, retinal dialysis, tear, and retinal detachment. And in case of uh, high velocity pellet injury, traumatic retinal disruption or retinal sclerotoria can be observed. Sometimes the uh, we see only vitreous hemorrhage or uh, patient is almost uh, blind or just PL positive and everything is okay. Uh, this could be because of optic nerve head avulsion. This has very classic uh, UHD finding which we should uh, go for. And in terms of it is associated, cataract is associated with the endophthalmitis and retained intraocular foreign body. This all we can suspect from the history as well as examination from the anterior segment. And we should try to uh, identify uh, these uh, pathologies, if possible, through the indirect ophthalmoscopy as well as 90D examination. These are the few examples what you can note. Uh, these are all clear me through clear media. I think it is very difficult to the cataract to identify these uh, few of these subtle things like uh, cordial ruptures uh, running through the center of the phobia, uh, the large macular hole along with the carotid atrophy at the peripapillary area, and sometimes there are. Uh, this pallor along with uh, submacular scar uh, because of trauma. And we know that traumatic cardiac is primarily because of uh, supranasal retinal uh, dialysis and sometimes large break. And at times the RD is associated with the, the cordial hemorrhage along with incarceration of the retina in the perforation side. So we have to, uh, we have to actually uh, think of what can happen in this particular case. It, it has to be case to case basis. Not there is a, not a standard formula to think. And I was uh, talking of this optic nerve evolution. If you see on ultrasound, the, the everything is converging to the optic disc. The optic disc area is enlarged. Then we have to think of the um, optic nerve uh, uh, evolution. Either it is complete evolution or it is partial evolution. 
the, the, the most important is the, the majority of the cataract, uh, uh, traumatic cataract has to be evaluated by the ultrasound. It is the most commonly performed imaging for trauma related to the eyeball. Uh, it is very helpful in localizing the ocular foreign body, be it metal or glass, and obviously to know the posterior segment structural damage due to the uh, trauma. Here are a few examples, like top and uh, uh, left hand side top photographs with the dense vitreous hemorrhage following the trauma. There is, there, it can be the uh, RD, retinal detachment, and it can be uh, retained intraocular foreign body, like the, the left hand side button photograph. You can see there is a, the, the, there is a radio opaque or uh, hyper uh, echoic uh, lesion with the, uh, uh, which is casting shadow behind it. It's looking like almost an optic disc area, but it's not optic disc area it's because of shadowing of the foreign body, metallic foreign body. And there may be PBD along with vitreous hemorrhage. And obviously there's right hand side photograph is the optic nerve avulsion. These are the majority that very, uh, carries the poor prognosis and needs uh, uh, to uh, do a combined surgery along with the retinal procedure. So it is very important to evaluate the retina very carefully and the majority of them will require the, some kind of imaging. And CT scan, if you are suspecting some a metallic foreign body or if you are suspecting simultaneous uh, orbital injury or if you are suspecting some kind of uh, optic nerve injury, then we should go for CT scan <coughs> to evaluate the orbit or bony, bony structure along uh, before going for cataract surgery. And MRI for detection and localization of the non-metallic foreign body like vegetable material, plastic, and glass foreign body. Finally, uh, though you don't do routinely, VP can be done in case of a, a total cataract with, uh, say, total uh, RD. Whether the patient has any vision potential, we should go for surgery or not. We can go for a visual liver potential. In conclusion, no traumatic cataract cases are alike. It should be uh, cared. I mean, it should be. Uh, evaluated individually for individual patient and mm, the, the, the basic mechanism of injury should guide us how we are going to examine the patient, how we are, what we are uh, going to see inside the eye. So proper clinical evaluation and appropriate imaging before traumatic cataract surgery can guide us in counseling the patient, planning operative steps and predict the post-operative outcome. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Pranav Das, sir, for this uh, nice presentation and along with the images. Uh, so we will have one or two quick questions here. One question was that uh, when many a times we have uh, uh, trauma patients where we suspect uh, rupture, but we cannot see a very clear cut rupture or there are scenarios where we have a sealed corneal perforation or sealed rupture and all these things. All in, the, in, the, in such scenarios, whether ultrasound should be done or if it is done, what all precautions should be taken? So I request uh, panelists uh, and the chairpersons to take this question. So what all precautions need to be taken when we suspect uh, open globe while doing an ultrasound? Or should, we, should it be done? Dr. Baragi or Dr. Uh, Subhendu Baral, sir? And Dr. Rupak Kanti Biswas, sir? Hello. Yeah, please, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, can you just repeat it once more? Sir, Sorry. question? Yeah. yeah, so yeah. The, question, the question was, sir, that uh, if we suspect uh, open globe uh, in a trauma patient, globe yeah. rupture, but it's not cl clearly seen, then what all precautions should be taken in doing ultrasound? Or if, it, if there was a sealed corneal rupture or anything, and should an ultrasound yeah. be done in such scenario? Yeah, if you can do a very gentle ultrasound, ultrasonography, that you can always take it up. Otherwise, if it is, a, if it is, a, you know, uh, when there is a significant amount of uh, 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 subconjunctival hemorrhage, so, and you are not seeing, not able to see the posterior uh, end, so always there is, uh, 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 you know, subtle rupture uh, in the scleral rupture behind that. So uh, the most important is that you should not. Uh, it, uh, what we always mention is that we we need to do a sterile and gentle ultrasonography. So if you are not able to see the fundus, the sterile and gentle ultrasonography, you can just touch the probe and you always can get away with, with this ultrasonography. It is possible, it's possible. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, so we'll have to move to the next topic. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Somnath Chakravarti, who will be demystifying fluid for us in neovascular AMD. Uh, Dr. Somnath, uh, please share your screen. Uh, 
hello good evening everyone is my screen uh, visible yes sir okay so uh, greetings from uh, greetings from north bengal and at the outset i thank shukotada and the scientific committee of wwb for giving me this opportunity today so i'll be speaking on the role of fluid in management decisions of uh, wet air md so a quick recap so how have we progressed in uh, using uh, anti vegf what are the what is what was the way the protocols have evolved over the years so we all know that way back in 2006 the marina and anchor trials the pivotal trials of anti vegf in wet air md came and they established anti vegf as a standard of care in uh, wet air md but they suggested monthly injections now this was very cumbersome but thankfully by 2009 we had the what we call the uh, pronto study which showed that some oct guided uh, treatment protocol was also feasible provided we uh, kept following the patients every month so this was what we call the prn protocol and subsequently uh, the cat and the views trials which were large rcts uh, have shown that indeed uh, prn protocol is a feasible way to treat wet air md patients however once patients are switched to a prn regime from a monthly injection both the trials showed that there was a drop in best corrected visual acuity by one to two letters so this is why we over and again monthly follow up is very cumbersome so uh, by 2015 we had this new approach that is what we call that treat and extend approach which is an individualized approach where patients are treated proactively but uh, at every visit but depending on the clinical scenario depending on certain uh, protocol guided factors the follow up is gradually extended now over the last few years uh, most review of studies comparing prn versus trex regimen has shown that the visual outcomes are better with trex regimen and therefore this has now become the step protocol of choice in wet air md so a brief uh, recap of the treat and extend regimen so the key points are that you initiate treatment uh till a patient becomes dry or have has a maximum maximum response then you gradually extend the gap or interval between the treatments but the maximum interval that is allowed between any two treatment is that of 12 weeks that is 3 months and if there is any recurrence at all you start all over again and this time once you have achieved again dry or maximal response you extend cautiously but then uh, uh how practicable is this in our real life scenario so i'll just share few cases so this was one patient a 78 year old male complaining of defective vision in right eye so he had 624 vision it's a subphobial cnp srf so i started treatment with antivirals and after three injections this was his picture there was still some subphobial uh, present his vision had however significantly improved and there was no hemorrhages in the fundus but since there was still some fluid left so i theoretically we should go on with treatment so i i thought that i will try to dry out this uh, retina so i kept injecting him every month but even after three more injections there was hardly any change uh, there was no, there, the retina did not dry up and vision was still have 69 and at this stage the patient said that doctor sub you know really do you really need to keep on injecting like this uh, i really don't need any more injections so what should i do so this was one case second case a patient who came to me uh, with complaint of poor vision in the right eye after for almost 10 months so you can see there was a large subphobia there was a large cnvm with active cnvm and there was a lot of intraretinal fluid 4 by 60 vision again i initiated treatment by four injections this was the picture there was no hemorrhages seen uh, vision had also improved slightly and there was no intraretinal no fluid the macula had dried up now i kept following her up she did not obviously uh, she did not agree for any injections so i sort of did a prn in her but after three months she had a reactivation with uh, some fluid coming back her vision was still uh, had dropped and there was some hemorrhages also i re i i told her that again we should treat because there seems to be some activity so we gave her injections and after three injections you can see that there is uh, still some intraretinal fluid left you can see here but the lesion itself appeared to have uh, increased in size and vision unfortunately from baseline even after seven injections 
had actually dropped and she was very unhappy. A third case, a 56 year old female who had presented to us with a complaint of poor vision for two months, 618 vision, a peak, a PED um, with subretinal fluid. So I gave her a brolosuzumab, one injection, and this is how she looked after a month. So her macula has dried up completely. The PED is still there. Uh, vision has also improved significantly. What should we do? Do we keep treating and extending? So these are the kind of scenarios all of us face in the real world, and real world is challenging. So we all know that weighted MD is a chronic condition requiring continuous long-term treatment. It is not difficult to initiate, but the challenge is in maintaining patients on the right treatment. As real world studies show that 50% of patients drop out within one year and 70% by two years. So the, the main challenge for us uh, who are handling weighted MD in the real world is how to individualize the injection frequency and follow-up frequency so that it becomes appropriate. Now, we definitely don't want to under-treat because we all agree that delayed retreatment of reactivated disease leads to permanent loss. And longer the delay, the worse the recovery. But we also don't want to be over-aggressive and end up over-treating because it is a fact that uh, our major RCTs have shown that there are one third patients uh, uh, who actually do quite well with just one or two injections in the maintenance phase. And uh, nearly half the patients can be extended to a gap of um, uh, three months, 10 to 12 weeks, even on a treat and extend protocol. And of course, the CAT trial, since the CAT trial, we have also uh, uh, been told repeatedly that there have been suggestions from RCTs that patients who are treated aggressively with monthly injections ended up having a higher risk of progression to macular atrophy. So we don't need, don't want to over-treat, but we cannot under-treat. So the way ahead, obviously, is to have an individualized treat and extend regime, or at least an individualized PRN regime. But then how do we decide uh, on case-to-case -case basis? So this is where fluid or the OCT morphology plays a very key role. So there are three ways that we have to analyze the fluid the subretinal fluid, the intraretinal fluid, and the sub-RPE fluid. So subretinal fluid studies suggest if it's present at baseline predicts a good outcome, resulting in favorable visual outcomes. The result is even better if patient has PVD along with SRF, because these kind of patients have been seen to benefit from less incentive, intensive treatment regimes. And the fluid study has also shown that a small amount of fluid, residual fluid, less than 200 microns, can even be tolerated without impact on visual acuity, and uh, especially on a treat and extend regime. However, recurrent subretinal fluid is predictive of poor functional prognosis. And studies also suggest that uh, SRF uh, at baseline is usually associated with increase in retreatment frequency. So it probably needs fewer injections, uh, probably needs uh, a certain amount of uh, injections in certain cases, a more amount of injections, but uh, a minimal amount of fluid can be observed. And definitely if associated with PVD, these patients probably can do even without a very aggressive therapy. Intraretinal fluid, again, its presence at baseline is a predictor of a low visual acuity, irrespective of the agent or protocol use, whether you try a PRN protocol or a uh, and extend protocol or the newer anti-VEGFs or the older anti-VEGFs, presence of IRF, IRF at the baseline has been universally seen to be predictive of a lower, poorer outcome at the end. Now, IRF again can be divided into two categories, exudative, where the patients, these will, these will be small cysts, and they tend to decrease after the loading phase, or degenerative, these are large cysts, and they tend to persist even after the loading phase. So some suggest that these degenerative intraretinal fluid probably can be observed. And then of course, sub-RPE fluid. So PED uh, is an important OCT biomarker of uh, the lesion, especially after the analysis of the VIEW study. Uh, this sub-RPE fluid has now become very important because as seen in the second year of VIEW uh, analysis, that if a PAD can be absorbed, can be observed in absence of IRF and SRA, but needs close follow-up, because any increase in PED height or volume is, um, or appearance of a new PED is invariably a sign of lesion, lesion activity, and they must be treated. Again, like SRF, PED has been seen to be associated with an increase in retreatment frequency, more so 
if we are shifting a patient from a fixed dosing to a flexible dosing. So a quick recap, SRF, higher chances of visual gains. If associated with PVD, maybe patient will require fewer injections. A small amount of persistent SRF may, be, may not be so bad, but any recurrence is. Intraretinal fluid, they tend to have worst visual acuity to start and have the least visual acuity gains by the end. But we need to differentiate between exudative and degenerative cysts in the, before deciding on retreatments. And then sub-RP fluid does not help predict the final visual outcome on its own, are more likely to develop recurrences. And we need to be cautious when uh, managing these patients because PD itself is a sign that the CNVM is still there. So based on these observations, Ashraf et al. has recently suggested a way to go ahead in the maintenance phase in treat and extent. So this is an individualized treat and extent protocol where you initiate treatment uh, with uh, three loading doses and then evaluate the patient after three months. Now, 65% of the patient is expected to, be, to have a dry macula. Now, if these patients also have uh, had SRF at the beginning and also have PVD, then they suggest that these, these patients do not need that aggressive follow-up and may even be observed and not really and not put on a treat and extend protocol, uh, observed uh, with monthly follow-up and then gradually extend and the follow-up can be extended depending on the case. If a patient, however, has a PED alone at the end of the three months, they say that we should be cautious and we should either put the patient on a very gradual extension or keep, keep the patient on a uh, monthly ranibizumab or bimonthly aflibacid. For other morphologies, they, say, they say that we should we can extend by two weeks in two weeks step, depending on the case. In those with persistent fluid, they suggest that we should we can continue or rather we should continue with the same treatment and not switch for almost nine to 12 months. If the fluid still persists after in, that happens in five to 10 months, five to 10 percent, then either we switch after 12, nine to 12 months. And if the patient becomes dry any time between this nine to 12 months, then we again extend as before. So if we apply these cases, so if I come back to my first case who responded uh, well with the first three injections, but never really became dry, but had a very good visual acuity, what do we do? So probably I can say that this patient has only, only minimal SRF, which is persisting even with uh, multiple anti vegf injections. The vision is not changing. Clinically, there is no sign of activity. Therefore, I would be uh, probably not uh, unjustified to just put him on observation. That's what I did. Uh, fortunately, in this patient, uh, the fluid also went away with time on its own without any other further injections and the vision was maintained. Now, this patient was obviously very unhappy with me because I gave her so many injections and we ended up actually having a drop in vision. So probably my mistake was that I should have counseled her better in the beginning itself because she presented with only IRF and uh, that too significant amount of large cysts at the baseline. And probably I should have told her that this itself is a predictor that you may not have a very good outcome in the long run. So she refused any further treatment and over and the last time I saw her, that was almost seven months since the last injection, she actually still had some cyst and the vision had dropped further. And what about this patient I treated with brolosuzumab? Well, uh, this patient had no IRF or SRF left, only PED. So as it is suggested now that we can observe such patients. So I did not give the, uh, I did not load him with any further injections but observed, but then I told him that we need to keep you under close observation. And that's what we have been doing since. He comes for um, every month. And at the last visit, which is almost four months since the injection, his vision is still maintained and the PED is still there, but thankfully there is no fluid. So the gist of my talk is that treatment with anti vegf is the standard of care in neovascular AMD. Uh, but in the real world, we must customize the treatment in every patient. <laughs> Quantitative and qualitative analysis of the fluid in OCT uh, can really help us do this customization. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful presentation and you have beautifully demystified all the fluids for us. I would like uh, to ask you one thing that is, can you please elaborate on uh, sometimes uh, like the residents also, we have many residents with us today. They confuse the outer retinal tubulation with so, cystic fluid. So if you could for our residents uh, differentiate between an outer retinal tubulation and a cystic fluid, please. Okay. 
so <laughs> if outer retinal stimulation will have a uh, the entire wall will be uh, hyper echogenic uh, if if i uh, if you understand that it will be white it will be a white round cyst but a with a white border but a cyst thick fluid will not have this white margin that is how i think will be the simplest way to um, differentiate between the two yes so thank you sir also another thing like uh, you have elaborated in your talk that you would not go for a dry retina but it is after multiple injections so when do we decide that like what is the end point like when do we decide that we can leave it or when do we decide we can we have to still go on treating so what is the point of futility is a very difficult question to answer especially in a real world where we don't do treat and extend so the first patient that i showed were i was lucky that the patient uh, stayed with me and uh, agreed to so many frequent visits and injections uh, otherwise since we in real world usually do what we call observe and plan that means we treat we see how the retina is doing and then, then we uh, decide on reinjections i think the message should be that you try to dry the macula but as i have said in my uh, presentations that if it is only a ped so it is also a type of fluid but we may not go aggressively behind that if it is just a minimal amount of srf which is persisting with repeated injections and vision is not showing any change the fundus looks uh, there is no sign of hemorrhages or any other activity on the clinical evaluation maybe there you can stop but initially obviously um, all the studies agree that uh, when you initiate therapy your target should be that if possible you dry the patient okay sir hope i could answer that question yes sir Good um, do we have any other question? Uh, all the questions in the chat box have already been answered. Thanks to our lovely. Uh... One question. I have got one question. Uh, yes, to sir. the panelist, uh, a patient having diabetic patient having cataract referred this case to the retinologist. And he suggested the multiple injection of activates, but after one or two injections, on the patient's demand, can I go for the cataract surgery? Shoulder up or bohiragi or jaira uh, bus? Yeah, if you have a dry macula, you can go for cataract surgery, and if you have fluid, persistent fluid uh, on OCT. Uh, if the cataract is significant, you can go for combined FECO emulsification plus anti VEGF. Thank you. So regarding this uh, topic, uh, would it be also advisable to add a steroid after cataract surgery? Because, uh, like, instead of just giving anti VEGF, yes. do we also combine a steroid injection with the anti VEGF? Uh, um, no, I would uh, since I operate both the retina and cataract. In such situations, I would prefer to have a Ozudex implant in the eye before going ahead with cataract because it will yeah. take care of the post-op uh, CME for the coming two three months. Kumar, you are muted. Again, I think uh, for this question, we'll have to go back to what Dr. Saurabh Sinha sir said, that cataract will not increase or uh, will not in, uh, it's not an emergency and the cataract surgery can always be delayed. And uh, until we have a dry macula, uh, we can if we can avoid cataract surgery until the macula is dry, is always good. But in clinical scenario, practical scenario, sometimes the cataract is so dense that we have to combine uh, cataract surgery with injections. So in such scenario, what our panelists suggest, should we combine cataract with anti-VGFs or combine cataract with IVTA or steroids or other steroids? Um, so, Dr. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, uh, I totally agree with Jaira. I usually, if uh, uh, the uh, macula shows the presence of fluid even after uh, previous injections, uh, I'll go for uh, cataract plus... Uh, uh, or judex or IVT. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, it is quite often uh, if the cataract is dense, we cannot see the macula. But if we try the OCT, at least we can get a very faint picture whether there is fluid or not. And in those situations, probably it's better to try to give anti-VEGF and repeat the 
OCT. OCT. That's OCT. what I try yes. to go. Yeah, repeat the OCT. And always you can uh, combine the cataract with IVTA or OZUDEX if the fluid is coming down. Probably means uh, what's, what everyone else is opining in that. OCT does help probably, isn't it? Yes, always. Yeah, especially swift source OCT, uh, you can get the yes. enemies. Uh, At least a faint OCT. idea where the, where, yeah, if yeah. the fluid is there. Yeah, you can yes. And one more question was that if we are combining cataract surgery with ozodex, so what will be the time when you want to inject the ozodex injection? Because the injection technique is different. So at the end of surgery, when you put IOL or before before cataract surgery, before putting the IOL, when do you put the ozodex? I, I preferably do it uh, after putting the IOL when there is still before doing the visco wash. I think that that time uh, we have stability of the globe also. And if there is a bit of manipulation also, it will not lead to a chamber decompression. I don't know about others can opine. Yeah. So I give other in the surgery. And because ultimately you check your own, you know? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because there is a risk of uh, hypotony and prolapse of the IOL uh, with Ozudex injection. There is, a, there is a remote risk. And it is, uh, so keeping the globe intact with, yeah. uh, with Visco is a good idea. Okay. Or you can just yes. inject one month before the cataract surgery, if possible. Yes. I think yes. then that will be safe and there will yes. be some effect of the drug also. Drug also, yes. So, any more questions and comments from the uh, panelists, speakers, audience? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out one thing that uh, pigmented lattice I have seen is uh, kind of uh, feel more dangerous and threatening than normal lattices. And uh, most of them, they can tear off uh, during a PVD. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a known fact. It's, it's not a personal opinion. Yes, yes. Sure. This is a documented... Uh, no, no, sort of the... the sort of, there are some people who say that pigmentation mm. around a lattice it is kind of a reaction. Say. Forget yeah. <laughs> what they say, Ryan, what Ryan says, what Fabian says, I think you go by that. Pigmented lattice and paravascular lattices are dangerous. Even dangerous, paravascular. Yes, yes, yes. Some paravascular lattices sometimes travel so posteriorly, posteriorly that we cannot even reach to do laser to the posterior end. It, they reach or sometimes quite up to the disc. Quite dangerous. No, quite pigmented dangerous. lattice means when there is a pigment within the crisscross, you see. And, uh, you know, Peri lattice, there are sometimes you can see that uh, some CRA patches of pigmentation surrounding the lattice, even with, in absence of any history of laser. So that is different. So pigmented lattice means what do you mean? Is a crisscross, white crisscross, which is associated with pigments. Right. Right, sir. Right. Okay. Hand over the session to Dr. Shogotopal for his closing comments if we don't have any more questions. Okay. It was excellent session. It was excellent session. Well conducted by Sneha and both, both Saurav. Thank you. Sir. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Thank you to uh, all the speakers. Yes. 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 Hello. I, Please unmute yourself. I have yourself, a comment sir. regarding the trauma. Please tell. Hello. Yes. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. We are Hello. audible, sir. You are audible, uh, sir. Please go ahead. I have one comment regarding the trauma, uh, ocular trauma and the cataract, traumatic cataract. The most important thing when the patient comes to you first, you must record the, all the in details uh, about the injury. That is a, in, uh, there is, the, it is very important for police case. So that has to be uh, taken care of if there is any any injury by some any, any assailant. So that case, in that case, you have to record. That has to be, that is, you should be careful. Otherwise, uh, the court will take you, uh, you know, say that you have not recorded this and you will be insulted in the court. So that point has to be taken. And the first general, general ophthalmologist, if any, they have seen that has those points has to be kept and uh, recorded first in your history. And you have to mention what you have got in the injury cases. Otherwise, everything is uh, very nicely taken. Every uh, uh, talk was very nice and pronounce uh, was, was very de uh, in details. Everybody has done very well. Thank you very much. Okay. 
thank you sir thank you very so nice if, meeting okay thank you thank you very much so if there is no other comments or question i would like to close the session i would like to thank the chairperson sir uh, and our panelists and speakers and also beautiful moderation by sneha and uh, dr kumar saurav and very active participation from all the panelists actually which makes the meeting very very interactive and uh, helpful so thank you and uh, at the end i would like to thank novartis for sponsoring this meeting thank you novartis so uh, we will again meet within next few weeks we have a meeting on nabh please do join us that will be a very important meeting on nabh and please do join us thank you sneha if you can stop the recording please